Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. This is session number 98, uh, and uh, we are ready to go back to the bedside of our patient here this evening. Uh, I've been thinking about, uh, uh, the, you know, of course, tonight is all about the medical discussion, uh, as Gandalf is finally going to get to conveying some uh, real information in that he's actually going to be talking at the very least about Frodo's uh, uh, condition here tonight. So uh, we're going to we're going to be looking at that. I, and I apologize. My uh, wife is a doctor and I was near where she was doing her charts. Uh, so doing all the medical stuff, I just couldn't help myself. Uh, I've been married to a doctor now for 22 years, so I like uh, I, I, I quite like medical jargon. It's fun. Um so anyway, uh, DX means diagnosis, uh, by the way. By the way. Uh, so uh, the DX of F Baggins is the, is the title of, uh, of, of our class here tonight. Um, all right. So we're going to, where are we going to be? We're going to get ready here. Excellent. Okay, cool. So um, quick, uh, before we start here tonight, uh, we're going to... I just want to do some quick announcements. First of all, one really quick thing that which just happened today. Uh, we finally got our uh, uh, Signum University, we finally got our Amazon Smile account set back up. So if you use Amazon Smile, um, I want to encourage you not that, you know, to compete with other charities, but I'm totally competing with other charities uh, and uh, would love for you if you would be willing to to name Signum University as your charity of choice in Amazon Smile. Really awesome, easy, simple way to, you know, make some small contributions to Signum. Uh, the Amazon Smile program is really cool. Uh, we're big fans. Uh, so just to just to point that out, uh, that that's a possibility for you, should you be so inclined. Um, another uh, quick thing that's happening at Signum University here this week, uh, we're doing a, uh, a, a promotion special, uh, another anytime audit promotion on our modern fantasy class. We're sort of celebrating the Game of Thrones uh, 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 season premiere uh, this week, and it's going to be... Uh, um, uh, What's his? Uh, uh, sorry, blanking. Peter Beagle. Peter Beagle's birthday. He's gonna. He's turning eighty this month. Uh, and uh, that class, uh, Modern Fantasy One, uh, contains both uh, Game of Thrones and uh, The Last Unicorn. Um, both really fun books to discuss. Uh, the Last Unicorn. I could talk about that for a really long time. That was a really. That was a really neat book to talk about. Anyhow, uh, so. Um, just to let you know, again, we're running a special on that. That will go through uh, uh, through April twenty second. So through. Monday week. Uh, so just to, to draw your attention to that. And of course, this weekend, I'm going to be in just a couple days, I'm going to be flying to the Netherlands. Uh, my first visit to the Netherlands, really excited about that. I'm going to be in Nadermoot this weekend on Saturday. I hope to, uh, I look forward to seeing uh, some of you there. I don't know how many people in attendance tonight are able to make it, but I know that a bunch of people that I have met on our Twitch stream here and in other broadcasts are going to be able to make it there, and I'm really looking forward to that. So uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. Still possibility to sign up if you're around and you want to come pop by. That would be awesome, uh, and you could totally attend. Um, don't forget that uh, Mythmoot, of course, is coming up at the end of June. Still plenty of time to register for that uh, in Leesburg, Virginia. 27th of June through the 30th of June, our big, big conference of the year. Uh, it's going to be so, this is going to be fun, and then uh, our summer semester starts on May 6th. So there's still a few weeks to sign up for classes before that begins. All right, uh, working on your Mythmoot costume. Yes, the masquerade ball is always fun uh, at uh, uh, at Mythmoot. Uh, my uh, my 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 wife and I did a uh, a team costume last year. We dressed up as Jonathan and Mina Harker from Dracula. Uh, that was uh, that was that was fun. Um, anyway, uh, so so what was I going to do? Oh yeah, okay. So let me get back to um uh i've got so many windows open here okay all right here we go we're good so let's get back with one question before we uh head back to the uh to the to the text here tonight to uh frodo's bedside um and uh this actually is a little bit unusual instead of going back to weathertop i saw you guys thinking we were going to do that today instead of going back to weathertop we're only uh just talking about 
What? Oh, I say, hang on. Yeah, good call. There we go. Hi, Tony. Thanks for pointing that out, Tony. Um, uh, t- uh, we are um, we're going back to um, uh, just last class, right? Uh, a question from Marielle. In session ninety-seven, we joked about the thickness chart, like the pediatrician's pain chart in Gandalf's evaluation of Frodo's health. In particular, uh, imagining Gandalf asking how solid he appeared to Frodo. Uh, but mightn't Gandalf appear more real to Frodo in the Wraith world, as the Nazgul or Glorfindel did? Yes, the Maya who became the wizards agreed to the diminution of their available power and to a cloaking of their majesty, but Gandalf still speaks of being able to uncloak himself, and, spoilers, he does appear luminescent in his battle with the Balrog, so some aspect of his divine nature is still visible sometimes during his sojourning in Middle-earth. Would then he appear in some other, more spiritually real form to one in the Wraith world, not fade into indistinct shadows as Aragorn and the other hobbits do? Um... Great question. Uh, my um, uh, so I, I, one thing I would point out about uh, Mariel's comment here is that it's really interesting to me. Um, it's a really interesting test case, right? Uh, it's kind of too bad that we can't like experimentally expose Frodo to Gandalf when he was in that altered state, right? Uh, before he crossed the ford, um, because it would be a really interesting question. Um, on the one hand, and JJ, I think you were responding to Marielle on the discussion boards um, and saying very sensibly, Gandalf, of course, is not merely... Uh, manifesting his physical body, right? You know, if he were somebody like, you know, one of the other Maya or one of the Valar from Valinor who puts on a body in order to walk among, uh, you know, the, the creatures of Middle-earth, um, it might be different, right? They, like, if you were to see someone in that situation while you were in Frodo's altered state, you would almost certainly see uh, uh, the difference, right? Be able to pick him out of a crowd pretty easily. Would that be the case of the uh, with the with the Astari with the wizards, right? Because the wizards clearly, even before Tolkien really worked this out, before he really uh, uh, sort of expanded on the idea and articulated it more clearly uh, in the essay on the Astari, it's always still uh, clear that this is this is not just a manifestation, right? Uh, we see that quickly, right, from The Hobbit and and in The Lord of the Rings, like, Gandalf is afraid to die. Um, it, he's He is incarnate. He is not just, uh, he is not just a manifestation who can kind of blink himself out back into the spiritual world or something like that. Um, but he does use that metaphor of uncloaking. Then you will see Gandalf the Grey uncloaked, we saw in Gandalf's first big scene uh, in this book, right? Um, so what exactly does that mean? I don't think it's uncloaking in the sense um, of, um, I think it's uncloaking in the sense of like I will like reveal to you my real form that I'm keeping hidden from other people at other times. I don't think it's quite that simple because again, Gan- that doesn't seem to be how Gandalf works. It doesn't seem to be how Gandalf is is manifested. Um, Gandalf has a body, has a different relationship um, uh, to his body, right? Than you know, uh, even somebody like Melian did uh, in the Silmarillion. So, um, but it's really unclear. One of the things to keep in mind, and this is uh, starting to talk like this, can be an easy way to start making it sound like I'm copping out from answering the question, but um, one of the things that I like to kind of keep clear in my own mind, right, is... The difference between the story as Tolkien presents it in the text and the theories that he articulates later on, right? It's really tempting to take, like, what he writes about the Astari, the wizards, and what he writes about the Palantiri, right? In those two essays on the Astari and the Palantiri in Unfinished Tales, right? Which got published subsequently in in Unfinished Tales, right? Those are both essays, really sort of uh, compilations of uh, various things that he wrote in later, at later times on those two things after the publication of The Lord of the Rings. And so in those cases, right, this is Tolkien himself refining the ideas and working through stuff and therefore projecting backwards onto the text. Now, uh, Tolkien was a really careful reader of his text. Um, This is... uh, 
I have to admit, this is one of the things I, I shouldn't harsh on J.K. Rowling, but I will. Um, this is one of the th- reasons that I get just kind of annoyed at the sort of post-publication declarations of J.K. Rowling is that she tries to just like revise stuff, but without real attention uh, to the text. Like she just tries to insist on things um, that are simply not consistent with what the text actually says. Right. Tolkien. uh begins with his text as a basis, right? Um, and he, um, uh, he, he is generally very careful about that, but he is reinterpreting stuff, right? He is developing ideas which he did not have in his head when he wrote the original stuff, right? So when we want to, um, uh, when we want to, think about the you know so when we're trying to answer questions like this right like in this scene what would have happened or you know what's the real what what's the situation here i kind of like to separate the two things right to to try not to merely kind of take everything that tolkien said later on and 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 act as if it is you know sort of true all the way through it's not necessarily true all the way through um it can be made to work, right? And it's a perfectly valid, I'm not saying it's not a valid way to think about it, but it's not the only way to think about it. And we need to realize, right, that what we're doing is kind of combining the two different, um, the two different things, right? The story that Tolkien wrote and his later thoughts, uh, developing the ideas and reinterpreting some of the ideas, right? Um, anyway, so, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um Yeah. So anyhow, um I think so thinking about okay, so on the one hand, uh Twitter seems to be working again. My Twitter broadcast seems to be functioning. That's a good thing. The only thing I dis the my only current complaint uh is that I have my phone turned landscape to broadcast and people's comments are 90 degrees. So I keep craning my head like this, looking when people type comments makes it a little challenging anyway. I'm sorry, but that's better than being non-functional, which is where Twitter has been the last few weeks. So, you know, baby steps anyway. Um, uh, but I agree with you. I missed your name on Twitter, but, uh, uh, an idea of progressive, revelation, right? Something like that. Anyway, it's just, it's just important to con- contextualize and keep in mind, right? Um, and to remember that just because Tolkien had an idea later on and developed an idea doesn't mean that that's what he was thinking all the way through, right? It's so we can't just apply that sort of simplistically. Here's how this is all relevant to the Gandalf question. How this is relevant to the Gandalf question is that his discussion in the, um, uh, in the essay from the Astari, right? Uh, the essay on the Astari, rather, in Unfinished Tales. That's not uh, something which underlies his depiction of Gandalf. It's something that is derived from his picture of Ga- his, his depiction of Gandalf, right? He doesn't uh, the 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 sense that we get through the text of the story in which Gandalf appears to have a pretty firm relationship with his body, right? Where he's not just manifesting himself and could dematerialize at any moment. Um, that's, that's, it's not that he had that worked out. Oh, it's because the Astari are incarnate and that's why Gandalf is like this. It's the other way around, right? Gandalf is like this. And so that's why he said that in the essay. That's to me why it matters, right? I don't want to base our interpretation of the text just on what he says later. It's interesting to recall what he says later because it's relevant. But the primary thing, right, is about what happens in the story. Right? It was the primary thing for Tolkien, too, when he came to uh, when he came to do these things, when he came to uh, uh, to meant to 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 devise these theories later on. Um, uh, anyway, OK, OK. Um, yeah, exactly. Lilith and, 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 and Tony and several others are talking about how Tolkien tends to approach his own text as if he were, 
you know, as if he were basically the same way that he would treat, a, you know, a, a work of medieval poetry, right? Even when he finds inconsistencies, right? Uh, uh, you know, he he treats those inconsistencies as you know, like let's let us consider, you know, a combination of scribal error or you know, translational difficulties or whatever, which might have contributed to uh, uh, to this, you know, which which uh, could lead to this error being in the text, right? Uh, even when he's playing really fun games like that, again, he's still treating it like he would be treating other texts. Um, but, um, anyway, okay. So, as I say, so Mariel, this has been a long non-answer to your question. My particular theory, I guess, I don't think Gandalf would look luminous, and I don't think that, um, so wait, let me go back another step. Let me go back to the uncloaked comment. Um, what do I think Gandalf means when he says, you know, now you will see Gandalf the Grey uncloaked, right? I don't think that, um, I don't think that that means, again, my, I wear my physical body as a cloak and I'm going to, I, I, it's, he's speaking metaphorically there, right? Um, he is cloaked in the sense of concealing his power, not putting forth his power, his will. He is in the, yeah, JJ, as JJ says, it means the kid gloves are off, right? Yes, more like that, I think. Um, then you will see Gandalf the Grey uncloaked, he says to Bilbo, right? If you, sp if you say that again, you know, don't, uh, he is threatening Bilbo, right? Saying, I've been gentle with you. Right? I have never attempted to exert my will, exert my power over you. I've just, I've been your friend. I've been your guide. I've been your advisor. Right? Um, I have never tried to dominate you in any way. Right? I have never tried to. Do, um, but uh, if I, if you say that again, I shall become angry, and then you will see Gandalf the Grey uncloaked. Right? Then I will exert my power, and you'll see what it's like. Right, uh, and you might not like it. Um, I actually really quite liked what the the Peter Jackson's depiction of that. I remember it was one of my because of course it's very early in the film, right? I remember it was one of my first impressions that really left me kind of impressed at their interpretation. I, I, I liked what they did. It wasn't perfect, but that sense of like looming and like his shadow growing, the shadowy thing was a little darker than I would have wanted it, but still it was threatening, right? Uh, and this idea of like, I might look like a, you know, um, I might come across as just like, you know, this old guy who's your friend, right? But like, I'm kind of a big deal. And, you know, if I flex, you'll know, you'll know it. Right. Um, anyway, that's definitely what I, um, how I read the uncloaked. So it's not, it's not literal, I think. Right. Um, what would Frodo see if Gandalf uncloaked himself? I don't really know. See, um, you know, we're getting back to, um, um, and yeah, uh, uh, Professor Hobbit, yes. Uh, yes, uh, the idea of angelic visitors who sort of cloak themselves and conceal themselves. See, but, but see, that's more like what um, visiting Valar or Maiar would do in Middle-earth, right? If there were, just as there, you know, you may encounter an angel walking among us at unawares, right? To you, unawares to you, not unawares to the angel, right? Um, that angel will be cloaked uh, and you won't know it. Right. Just as we're told, you know, the Valar and the Maiar can conceal themselves and walk among us. But that's exactly what Gandalf isn't like, I think. Um, uh, that's w w we don't see him acting in that way. And that's more or less exactly what I think uh, Gandalf isn't saying. Um, again, that does happen. That's a very um, uh, a very sort of prevalent Tolkien concept, I think, uh, when he's describing the Valar and the Maiar in the, say, in the Valaquenta, uh, or in the Aina uh, in the Silmarillion. But that's not, it doesn't seem at all what it's like, uh, for, uh, for, for Gandalf. Yes, uh, Mary, exactly. We do have in the Silmarillion some references to Aloran walking as an elf, uh, among them, right? So get... Oloran in the first stage, right, did appear cloaked like an angel among them, right? Not Gandalf. Um, not Gandalf here. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and you are right, Oakfan. We shall remember this discussion about Gandalf when they fight the wolves in Eregion. Agreed. That's another really interesting incident. Um, and of course, when we get to uh, the Balrog. Oop, spoiler in Moria. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So. But again, back to the question, what would Frodo see in his altered state where he can see the ring wraiths really clearly, where he can see Glorfindel shining, you know, the white light through the form and raiment of the rider and Glorfindel as a as a figure like white fire right when he's at the ford um, and Frodo is is almost over the edge. Um, I uh, I think that. I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, I don't think that Gandalf would necessarily look different because here's the thing. What is Frodo seeing? Right. Frodo is seeing into the, well, we'll look more. We'll talk more. We'll get to more about this meh, this week or next week. Uh, but um, uh, we'll, we'll see in their discussion a little bit more. Uh, 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 Gandalf's going to finally give us some, some more details about this. We'll come back to this question when we see that, because I, I, it's tempting to say that Gandalf's, the power that Gandalf is uncloaking, I think is a different kind of thing. Um, would Frodo be able to see it if somebody, if Gandalf uncloaked himself in that sense, the sense in which he uses that phrase with Bilbo, if he exerted his power like that, would it show up? Would he, would it be visible? to Frodo when he was in that state? I, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, let's, um, let's keep going. Cause we're going to get to some of these descriptions here. Uh, <laughs> Stephanie says she keeps thinking of Star Trek cloaking. Yes, it is a risk there. Um, yeah, well, of course, Luke, of course, yes. If he's making literal fireworks, then everybody sees it, right? But, like, what would what would Frodo see? I don't think it's that simple. I don't think it's, you know, just the ability that he simply gained the ability to see stuff that way. Um, he didn't, for instance, see any visual representation of, like, the Witch King exerting his will. Right? He could just see the wraiths themselves. Um, uh More on this. More on this as we continue to discuss. So, Marielle, great question. Uh, really, really well thought of. I hadn't been thinking about this, uh, but now I want to as we continue on through. So let's um, let's uh, back to the diagnosis. Remember, Frodo has just been told that he's been here for several days, right? Days, said Frodo. Well, four nights and three days, to be exact. The elves brought you from the ford on the night of the 20th, and that is where you lost count. We have been terribly anxious, and Sam has hardly left your side day or night, except to run messages. Elrond is a master of healing, but the weapons of our enemy are deadly. To tell you the truth, I had very little hope, for I suspected that there was some fragment of the blade still in the closed wound. But it could not be found until last night. Then Elrond m removed a splinter. It was deeply buried, and it was working inwards. Frodo shuddered, remembering the cruel knife with notched blade that had vanished in Strider's hands. Don't be alarmed, said Gandalf. It is gone now. It has been melted. And it seems that hobbits fade very reluctantly. I have known strong warriors of the big people who would quickly have been overcome by that splinter which you bore for seventeen days. All right. Okay. Um... Great questions here. Um, I see Aragorn asking a good question about the melting of the splinter. Um, let's, well, why not? Let's start with that. Why do they melt the splinter? Um, it seems, it seems, okay, I find myself not wanting to say it out loud, but it seems relatively clear, I think fairly simple I, I I've titled this slide FB removal foreign body removal um, it's not just about the removal of a foreign body 
right? Uh, the splinter is not just a foreign body lodged in Frodo's flesh, which is going to, you know, g- get infected, right? Uh, and cause him to die of sepsis or something uh, if it isn't removed, right? In that case, the removal of the foreign body is all that's needed, right? But remember, this is, this is not a normal wound, right? Um, the splinter is not just an irritant or something, right? Or an infection agent. It is a spiritual connection, right? Fire is purifying, yes. But as both Matt and Tony says, melting the splinter unmakes the splinter, right? The splinter is destroyed. It is, and that, that, that's necessary, it seems, to be necessary, right? It is gone now. It has been melted, he says. Um, Don't be alarmed. It is gone now. It has been melted. Um, don't worry. It's gone and it's been removed from your person, right? And it's been melted. So it has been destroyed. The implication, therefore, is that if it hadn't been melted, if it hadn't been destroyed, then it could still have power over him. Remember, all the way from the beginning in this, from uh, Rivendell, from Weathertop on, um, we've seen this has been primarily a spiritual struggle, right? I don't want to say that the splinter is only a symbol. I mean, it's apparent, you know, within the story, it's a physical splinter, which is physically melted. But even within the, the reason that they melt it in the story seems to be because it is... It is an embodiment. It's more than a symbol because it's not just, again, it's not just an abstract thing. It is, it is like the physical link between Frodo and the will of the Witch King. Uh, in as much as that knife that he had, that Morgul blade, was an extension of his will, was a manifestation of his will, was uh, a means for him to exert his power, uh, his domination over Frodo, that splinter was the well, not evidence of it again, the mechanism, right? The, the, um, it was the connection. That was the thing that was enabling the Witch King to continue to, to, that, to, to bring Frodo more and more under his power. Had he gone all the way over? Had he faded completely, right? Had he responded to their summons? Come back, come back to Mordor, we will take you. Um, then he would have been under the dominion of the Witch King, right? Um, so the splinter is at the least a symbol, but again, I think more than that, an embodiment of that spiritual struggle. It had to be melted. It had to be destroyed. That link had to be broken between the Witch King and Frodo. Frodo could not fully heal until that had happened. Um, so, yeah, and uh, Tony says the unmaking helps to undo what it has done. That certainly seems to be um, seems to be implied. I mean, you could take it a couple different ways, right? He says, don't be alarmed. It's gone. It has been melted, right? Either you could take that as like, don't worry. It won't harm you anymore, right? Like if it hadn't been melted, maybe it will somehow, someday, right? Maybe it could still, or um, as a outward indicator of the way in which this is like your healing is complete, right? That that connection has been broken. Um, they uh, I, I, again, I think I think that sort of works either way. I'm trying. I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to is to 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 um, suss out here is the force, the intent of "Don't be alarmed." Right? In what sense is he? He he's encouraging Frodo. He's reassuring Frodo. Right? It's okay. Don't be scared. Right? Don't be scared in the sense of, is am I going to relapse? Right? Is this connection going to continue? Um, uh, I think the primary force of his reassurance there is, Frodo, it's over. Don't worry, it's over. Right? Yeah, it was pretty bad. Um, that sounds pretty creepy, right? That there was a splinter of that of that blade in your body and it was working inwards. Like, that's scary, right? That's a scary image. Um, and Gandalf is saying, it's okay, right? Um, yes, this thing that was moving towards your heart is no more. Um, yes, yes. Um, 
<laughs> much better than Tony Stark's solution, JJ. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yes. Um, so, again, the, the melting really seems to me to solidify this is not a physical complaint, not chiefly a physical complaint, right? It was never really primarily uh, a physical complaint. Um, this is a spiritual condition, and it seems that hobbits fade very reluctantly. Um, he is tough in the fiber, right? Hobbits have this resilience, which again is, is a physical resilience, but it's also more uh, than a purely physical resilience. Um, <laughs> did I say the melting solidifies something? Yeah, that's a bit of a mixed metaphor. Oh, well. Um, yeah. Galandar asks, is Gandalf as confident in Frodo's healing as he appears to be? Or might he be trying to sound more confident than he really is in order to lift his spirits? I think a little bit of both, Galandar, right? I, you know, we talked about how, you know, he has been cured, Right, we talked about that cured word last time. Um, when we know he's not actually completely cured, right? This wound is 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 never going to be perfectly healed. Um, does Gandalf already know or suspect that? Yeah, I suspect he does know or suspect that. Um, to that extent, I do think he's being a little extra cheerful. Um, he's not going into details about how there may be lingering effects, right, that last for the rest of your life. He's not going into that. And I think he's probably suppressing that for a reason, right? Um, but at the same time, I don't think he's just, like, hoodwinking Frodo or something like that. The point, the, the, the you know, the power, the Witch King's power over you through that wound is broken, right? And that seems to be legit. Right. Um, the Witch King's not going to be able to reestablish his bond with Frodo. Right. Um, Frodo is never going to start fading again as a result of this wound. And I think that in that sense, the melting of the splinter represents a permanent uh, healing. Not quite the right word, but uh, a permanent fix. Right. A permanent change there. Um, there will be lingering effects. He will be changed and he'll never be quite the same again. But he is cured of this wound. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, now, what exactly is Elrond's procedure, right? Um, does Elrond surgically remove the splinter from Frodo's shoulder? Are we to imagine? Um, are we to imagine Elrond with a scalpel and forceps, right, extracting the foreign body from Frodo's, you know, shoulder and chest surgically? First of all, I think the most important thing to note is we're not told this, and I think we're not told this for a reason. Um, even when we're going to see healing happening in front of our eyes, we're not told a whole lot about it, right? Um, like when Glorfindel uh, helped Frodo on the road. When the other scene that we have talked about, we have anticipated already a good deal, Aragorn's healing of Faramir and Eowyn uh, and Merry uh, in the Houses of Healing, we're still not going to really learn exactly what happened there, right? Um, we don't... E so even when we're like eyewitnesses of it, we're not necessarily gonna gonna see it. Um, so I wouldn't rule it out. Um, somehow there is a physical splinter and it was... and like it ended up being physically removed out of Frodo's person. Like that happened. Did it happen with scalpels? Did it happen by some other... Um, uh, by some other method, right? Did he... <laughs> Tony thinks there's a lot of tra la la involved in this. Yes, is it, was it a purely spiritual 
uh, contest between Elrond and ultimately the Witch King, right? And the, sort of the, the residue of the enemy's magic of the Morgul blade. Um, you know, did he sing a powerful song of of uh, uh, you know of, of 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 joy and hope that um, uh, that caused the Splinter to flee? You know, like that kind of thing could totally happen. Um, I could absolutely get behind the idea that he sung it out. Uh, 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 evil Dr. Cannon. Yeah, I can absolutely see that. Um, but, um, and yet, so, uh, Rococo, I doubt that it was melted inside him. That's actually interesting. I never even thought of that interpretation, but I suppose that's conceivable. Um, it was deeply buried and it was working inwards. It's gone now. It has been melted. I've always understood that as step one. We removed it from, you know, Elrond removed it from your flesh, right? Step two, we melted it. Um, maybe not, right? Harnuth was just thinking the same thing. What if they he sang a song of power, right, over Frodo, and it melted like the blade melted in the sunlight? In fact, the more I think about it, the more likely that seems, actually, um, given what happened to the rest of the blade, right? The rest of the... Because the, the melting... Um, and somebody was talking about this earlier on, and I have totally forgotten who it was. Um, but um, uh, but anyway, yeah, I, the rest of the blade melted without any assistance from, you know, a forge or anything like that, right? It, 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 no uh, extraordinary heat was involved, just the sun shine, right? Um, and when the sun rose, the blade melted. Did he melt it in that way? Um, you know, was there a, like a, uh, you know, does he sort of sing this song over the wound and, you know, this like black mist sort of oozes out, I, you know, did they have, to, did he have to lance the, the, the like black shadow that, that, you know, wafted up from the dissolving blade? I, you know, I don't know. Um, uh, but, um, Christie's asking and Mary was just asking about, uh, the, the, applications of the ring of air um no idea <laughs> we'd know very little about vilia and exactly what it did um but um uh but anyway you know it's um i don't know any reason to think that his ring has sp that that kind of specific applicability uh, to this kind of case. <laughs> but I mean, I gotta think it can't hurt, right? Um, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, but Brick tells, I agree, exposure to sunlight has a spiritual dimension. And the more I think about it, uh, the more I think that that's gotta be, I mean, we've seen, it's been a spiritual thing all the way along, right? Um, so yeah, Rococo, thank you for your question. And Harnuth was uh, wondering the same thing because, like, I I don't think I literally ever thought of that before. I always like it has been melted. I was always picturing like a forge or a crucible or something like that, right? Um, uh, like here, I've searched. You know, you like you know he extracts it with the forceps, put it puts it in a little you know, in a little metal crucible and it's like, take that away and melt it down. Right. Um, is what I've always imagined. Um, but why, right. Why should I be imagining that? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I, Give, especially give, thinking of the, the thing that really convinces me is thinking about that word melted in conjunction with what happened to the rest of the blade, right? It's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, Rokoko, you're right. I'm probably influenced by the fact that I've been married to a doctor for 22 years. Uh, that, that's, that, that's how I thought of it. Um, uh, but see, notice the life. He doesn't say it was taken out. He says it's gone. Right. Um, Elrond removed a splinter. Right. Removed is. The, so let's look at the words there. Right. I suspected that there was some fragment of the blade still in the closed wound, but it could not be found until last night. Then Elrond removed a splinter. It was deeply buried and it was working inwards. It is gone now. 
it has been melted. Removed is a little... Um, I mean, it's definitely the word removed that imag- led me to imagine him actually pulling it out. Um, but um, yeah, uh, Bricktails, I don't know how big the splinter was, but it's not tiny, right? Because I. Uh, the notched blade was visible, right? When Strider held up the knife, they could see that. So it's not like a tiny sliver of it, which would not have been obvious when you held up the blade, right? The blade looked notched. There was a visible chunk of the blade missing. Um, Yeah. It has been melted. Um, Yeah, the more I think about it, the more I also like the the melting inside him better as well. Um, Less mechanical surgery, more elf magic kind of seems like Elrond's bag, frankly. Um, And I love the idea of him singing it out. And I love even more the idea that Tralala Lolly was involved. Um, Maybe they had to get a whole uh, gang in. Right? <laughs> Let's hold a big tralalalali party right here in the. It's like the elvish version of uh, you know of an operating theater, essentially. Um, see, but Oakfen, did they reopen the wound? What evidence do we have that they reopened the wound? I'm not sure that we do. He says that feeling is coming back to his, but is that is he bandaged? Have we seen him bandaged? I don't f- recall any reference to uh, the bandage or anything, right? Um, yeah. Um, Fourth Dauntless is struck by the switch to the passive voice. Um, as um, um, yeah, trifle. I also agree that the the notch is almost certainly the tip of the blade. That's also what would be most obvious, right? Um, like if you just held up the knife uh, and it was notched. Uh, I mean, it's possible that it was like completely smooth all the way down, except for one little notch on the side of the blade or something. And you'd notice that too. But I, I think it's the tip. I mean, I, I that's uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Corey Schwab was uh, uh, noting the passive voice earlier as well. Um, Don't be alarmed. It is gone now. It has been melted. Now, the number one reason for the shift of the passive voice there is to is the is the parallelism, right? Not this parallelism in verb structure, because it is a shift from the active voice to the passive voice, but keeping the subject the same. Right. Um, It is gone. The fragment it is the subject. Right. It has been melted. The fragment, it, is still the grammatical subject of the sentence. But it's not the doer of the action, so you have to use the passive voice in order to keep it as the subject uh, of that sentence. Um, it is still a striking effect for Thoughtless. I agree with both you and Corey Schwab about that. Um, um, it is gone. It has been melted. That transition from I'm telling you something about it to I'm telling you something that has been done to it. The focus is still on the on the shard, right? On the splinter. Um, um, yeah, Tony, I agree. He does seem to be emphasizing that he wasn't the one to do it. Maybe, maybe. I think I agree with that. Um, but Valori, I agree also that passive voices also gives the process its mystery. Um, yes, yes. It has been melted is different from Elrond melted it, right? Um, yes. Melting occurred. <laughs> Melting occurred, and the splinter is now gone. Right? That's all you need to know. Right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, good. Um, no, Lalith, I don't think it's important how it happened physically, necessarily. 
um, like did he physically extract it or not first b- prior to melting it down. But it does have an impact to me on my understanding not necessarily of the splinter but of Elrond, honestly. Um, what kind of... Elrond is a master of healing. What does that mean? Right? We're told that Elrond is a master of healing. Um, what does that mean? Right? Um, is he, you know, uh, been trained in all of the most up-to-date surgical techniques? Um, is he someone who just has studied... A, I mean, is part of it that he has studied a great deal of, of, of anatomy, right? I don't think so. I mean, I'm not saying that I think Elrond is ignorant of anatomy, and he probably does know a very great deal about anatomy of humans, hobbits, and elves, but um, but I don't think that that's what's being conveyed there. Again, I come back to um, it is um, uh, it was I keep coming back to the fact that this whole thing has been a spiritual struggle from the beginning. And likely about a thing, first it was removed and then it was melted. Well, but that's the question, right? Elrond removed a splinter. Right. In the sense that it's no longer in Frodo's body. But what if he removed it by melting it, right? Causing it to disperse in the way that the blade dispersed when the sun rose, right? In which case, it's been removed, right? Removed by breaking its power, removed as the sunrise seemed to break the power of the Mor- of the rest of the Morgul blade, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> Ron Roos wants to know, how do you say the Hippocratic Oath in Sindarin? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, interesting. Uh, Matt was doing some searching in the e-text and says an odd piece of trivia. The only two times the word bandage appears in the entire book, uh, refers to blindfolds rather than anything bandaging a wound. Uh, that is interesting. Uh, I'm not sure I would have called that. Uh, that's, uh, that's cool. That's cool. Um, yeah. Um, Yeah, cool. Let's see. Um, yeah, so again, if and if you think about the the kind of things that Elrond has been associated... Again, I, I, one of the reasons that this matters to me, that I'm trying to figure out what I think is really most likely as a reading of this passage, is it, and it's, it's not about... Not really... I feel like I understand the splinter one way or another, right? It had to be removed. It has to be. Its power has to be broken. Whether that's a physical removal and a physical melting, or whether it's a spiritual removal by means of spiritual melting, doesn't necessarily change. Both of the both of those me- mechanisms are, to me, totally consistent with the idea of you know the splinter as uh, you know link between Frodo and the Witch King, the 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 embodiment of the power that the wound and that that sort of spiritual infection, right, had on Frodo. I'm fine with that either way, but it does change my vision of Elrond. So I go back to The Hobbit, right? The role that Elrond has in The Hobbit, I mean, yes, he advises them. He's a lore master as well, helping them find the moon letters and all that kind of thing and telling them about the ancestry of their swords. Um, But the chapter is also a short rest, right? And they get advice, but they also are refreshed, when they're there. Refreshment, right? Refreshment is a thing that happens at uh, Rivendell. You know, that's um, that's a major part of what we see uh, in Rivendell. Um, so, uh, that, and that seems to me, thinking about that very first association that we get with Elrond, um, and then carrying that over into this situation, right? And thinking about the whole spiritual battle that has been. Um, if what Elrond is doing is sort of a much more targeted and potent um, 
uh, version of like the, you know, Aragorn singing the Baron and Luthien song, right? That seems to me very, very possible. Um, yes, last homely house implying comfort and rest, uh, break tales is exactly it. Um, yeah. The one other element that I would point to here, and I think the other thing that always led me to a just without really thinking about it, imagine a physical operation here, um, is it could not be found until last night. And I wonder again, Rococo, if I'm being influenced by being married to a doctor, it could not be found until last night immediately has me thinking about, you know, like it didn't show up on the x-rays, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the radiologist report couldn't, couldn't localize the foreign body. Like that's, um, you know, the, the kind of thing that I, my, my mind, I think has been trained immediately to think about, uh, given my personal circumstances. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think that that's necessarily what that means. Right. Yeah, exactly. But Lori says like something having to do with die. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah, I don't think that that's what we, it could not be found. Notice again, going back, notice how we're working backwards sentence by sentence here. Um, Elrond is a master of healing, but the weapons of our enemy are deadly. The picture that that paints is of Elrond at war, right? At sort of in physical and not physical in spiritual conflict with the power of the enemy that was in the wound, right? So you've got Elrond exerting his power to heal and the power which was remaining in the wound. So there's this like spiritual wrestling match, right? That's happening over the, the body and spirit of Frodo. Now Gandalf puts in his two cents, right? To tell you the truth, I had very little hope. Why, Gandalf? Because you didn't think Elrond was up to it? No, for I suspected that there was some fragment of the blade still in the closed wound. I thought that there was still... The evil could not be driven out of Frodo because it still had an anchor. It was still rooted in Frodo somehow, right? So Gandalf is looking at this tug of war, right? That's happening between Elrond and the power of the enemy, right? As manifesting itself through this wound. And Gandalf is saying, okay, you know, there's your problem right there, right? The reason you're not able to prevail over this wound, Elrond, is that it's got, there's an anchor in there, right? Um, he is being still continually worked upon by this splinter, right? By this wound, right? By the power of the Witch King. Um, but it could not be found until last night. I don't believe that means, again, like I've always unconsciously interpreted the word found to mean located, like pinpointed, right? Oh, it's, it's here. It's, it's, it's not over there, right? If you're looking for it over there, you didn't find it, right? Now you got to move uh, you know, a few inches this way and you're good. That's where it is, right? That's what I had always kind of associated with that word found. It could not be found until last night, but I don't think so now. Now that I'm thinking about it, you know, in this new way, I think that what that sentence means, it could not be found until last night, is like, it couldn't be proven, right? Um, we were not certain. Um, he suspected. He's, that's his word, right? I suspected there was some fragment of the blade still in the closed wound. Um, and, uh, but it wasn't found. They were not able specifically to detect by whatever mechanism they use, right? Presumably not, uh, in fact, x-rays, um, but, you know, by some other form of, uh, uh, presumably spiritual sensitivity, yes, there is a splinter. And what's more, it is working its way inward, right? This splinter is burrowing in towards his heart. In other words, this wound, again, we can kind of interpret that symbolically, but I think that the symbolic interpret again, it's, 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 it's more than just a symbol, right? The wound is still active. The connection is still active. The will of the witch king is still working within Frodo and approaching his heart. Frodo is still in danger. The power of the wound was not able to be driven out uh, by Elrond, despite the fact that he's a master of healing because um, the wound is still active. It's still working on Frodo and n narrowing in on his heart, which again strikes me, again, not as a purely physical thing, but as a spiritual thing as well, right? 
Um, so when they found that, right, when they were able to understand how is this wound still like, what are they fighting against? What is what is going on within Frodo? What is Frodo's actual spiritual state right now? Um, that's what you know, what it means to find the splinter. They, they, they discovered, yes, there's a splinter there. Yes, it is working. It's not even in the closed wound, as Gandalf suspected, right? Gandalf says, um, I suspected there was a fragment of the blade still in the closed wound, which implies out here, right? Where the wound site was, which was already closed. Um, it's worse than that. It's not just that something... A fragment of the blade still in his shoulder, right, might imply... I mean, again, think of the symbolic force of that. That would imply that the the Witch King still has a foothold in Frodo, right? You know, like, you know, he's been, he's been tagged like a wild animal, right? Uh, he's been marked, he's been claimed, you know, but it doesn't suggest the active struggle still going on, right? That what they found upon further investigation, which again, I presume to be spiritual rather than physical, is that it's worse than that. It's not just a fragment still in the closed wound out in his shoulder. It's deep inside and working towards his heart. When they found that, now Elrond knows what he's fighting against, right? Now he does his spiritual surgery thing and he knows what he's targeting. Now he can sing the right song uh, and target the splinter and melt it right uh now because now he like the blade was exposed to sunlight now he's able figuratively to expose the splinter to sunlight right because now they know now they see what's happening and what's going on um uh and yes mike exactly that explains why it took so long they finally started looking inward from the wound location but again i don't think it's about you know we've got to do our scans further and further in. It's not just like, you know, again, it's, I don't think it's about, um, targeting it physically in his body, right? It's about understanding the wound, right? Knowing what you're fighting against, um, to you again, to use a different metaphor, like understanding exactly what poison has infected his body. So you know how to neutralize that particular poison. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Tony's wondering if, if th- there were elements of almost something more like a, uh, more like a, an, uh, something more like an exorcism, the driving out of the, the, the evil from within Frodo. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, in, um, uh, in some senses, yes. In some senses, yes. In some sense, I think <clears throat> what Elrond does to Frodo here uh, at, in chapter one of book two, or really between the two books, is more like an exorcism than what Gandalf is going to do to Theoden uh, in the Two Towers, right? Um, you know, uh, despite how the films depicted that. Um, yeah. Um, Stephanie wonders if this procedure has been performed before. I don't know. And again, I, I'm tempted to, um, I'm tempted to think back to Boromir, uh, uh, the old Boromir, right? Uh, who was wounded by a Morgul blade and whose life was shortened by it. We know there's precedent for Morgul blades. We know that Frodo is not the first person to receive a mortal wound. Gandalf's own words suggest it, right? I have known strong warriors of the big people who quickly, who would quickly have been overcome by that splinter which you bore for 17 days. Gandalf presumably has some basis for this. It could be speculation, right? Based upon the, the spiritual resistance that he has seen in strong warriors of the big people. Um, it may be that there is some actual kind of clinical experience underlying Gandalf's statement, uh, about, uh, strong warriors of the big people. Um, 
but um, but anyway, I do think that there's clearly precedent. So has Elrond experienced this before, something like this? Um, if so, why didn't he know right away? Like, why didn't he take one look at Frodo and be like, oh, it's going to be one of those worming inwards towards the heart wounds. Yeah, let me let me take care of that right away. Right. Why? Why does Elrond seem to have been caught on the hop by this? Um, but the fact that it took him so long to sort of properly diagnose it, because it sounds like then Elrond removed a splinter makes it sound like as soon as they did properly diagnose the condition, he was able to fix it. Right. Um, anyway, uh, the other thing, the thing I would, so is there some clinical experience with Morgul blades underlying this? Yes. So why is he, does he not figure it out? I exactly Arden Crayon. That's just exactly what I was thinking. Uh, this could be a next generation Morgul blade. We have precedents for this, right? Um, Morgoth had a very active R and D department. Um, and we have every reason to believe that Sauron does too. Um, the fact that the, the idea that the bad guys are continually, um, rolling out the next iteration of their weapons, right? Dragons. That's, a, this is a great idea. You know, it would be cooler winged dragons, right? That's a trend. That's a, that's a phenomenon that we see in, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, the Silmarillion in a lot of Tolkien's works. We'll see it with the ring rates for crying out loud, right? We'll get the Witch King 2.0 uh, uh, when we get to Minas Tirith, right? So uh, I think that this is very likely the first time they've seen exactly this kind of thing. That, that wouldn't seem to me impossible at all. Um, yeah. Anyway, um Yeah, I think this is, uh, yeah, I don't know what generation of Morgul Blade this is, but, you know, this is an advanced model. Um, and agreed, uh, Fourth Dauntless uh, and Tony, um, and neither of them have seen a wound, a hobbit with this type of wound before. Um, yeah, Fourth Dauntless suggests that maybe Elrond thought that any fragment would have wraithified Frodo long ago, right? Maybe maybe uh, Elrond ruled out a fragment left in the wound because he's like, no nah, way. I mean, he'd be, he yeah, he'd be a wraith days ago if this were, can't be one of those, right? Clearly. Um, possibly, possibly. Uh, that seems like a very, um, uh, I mean, I kind of like that reading actually, but, um, but I'm not sure. So, Valoria, I don't think it, well, it's not about Hobbit physiology, right? It, it's it's um, it's not about um, like anatomy, right? Um, nor is it even necessarily about like uh, you know immune system or something like that. I, I think it's mostly about the um, again about the spiritual stuff there, really. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Interesting, Pookie Mojo. I, I'm not, I, I don't. I'm not understanding. So you say you don't believe it because he recovered within a day after they found the physical splinter, right? So, but I don't understand how that's relevant. Um, that that's kind of what I'm talking about, right? Um, again, whether he physically extracted the splinter and then melted it like in a crucible or something, or whether it was uh, spiritually melted like the blade was, but within Frodo's body and thus removed, right? The result is the same in both cases, right? There was a splinter it had to be gotten rid of, and then its power had to be broken, right? Um, again, as I was saying before, I don't think either one way or the other doesn't change my view of the splinter or the wound or Frodo's condition or the Witch King. I, that seems consistent either way. The, what do what it does make a difference to me is is Elrond and understanding Elrond. Um, so so yeah, again, and he, certainly yes, he recovers uh, very soon after they find the splinter right after the splinter is removed. Um, uh, yeah, he recovers very quickly, 
but hobbits do, right? I think, Luke, as you were just saying, I think in your sideways uh, uh, quote there on on, on Twitter. Um, yeah. <laughs> Boomful says, poor Sauron. Hobbits created just to be his nemesis, obviously. You know, uh, this is one of the things, one of the things that's been really interesting in studying, especially the vicissitudes of the Witch King's um, career here in his opposition of hobbits and how strangely, I don't want to say overmatched, right? Um, I, 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 he has been, that that's too much, right? But I have always emphasized in my own mind that the hobbits and the hobbits as ring bearers and, you know, the speech which Elrond is going to make at the end of the Council of Elrond, which, you know, we'll be talking about, you know, in about 15 months. Um, uh, you know, when he when he uh, when he talks about, you know, this is the hour of the Shire folk, right? That like small hands do them because they must, right? That that's always what I've sort of focused on, right? This is the time for. Uh, uh, you know, this is a thing that can be undertaken by the weak um, uh, uh, as much as well as the strong. But, you know, um, I don't. I, that, yes, I'm not disagreeing with Elrond completely, but I'm not sure that that's the whole story. Um, the point or perhaps another way of saying the same thing, honestly, is those who look to be weak are in a different way strong. Um, anyway, yeah, the underestimation of hobbits is a, is is real, Bongsmond. I, I, I agree. Everyone underestimates hobbits. Um, and the enemy most of all, it would seem. Um, yeah. Now, Rococo, I do think that that's true. Um, uh, she asks, is, is it only, uh, Frodo's Hobbit resilience that let him continue for 17 days or if, or is there some, you know, combination of, you know, the, being named an elf friend, Gildor's blessing, uh, you know, being touched by Elbereth and I mean, you know, can't hurt. Right. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, that's, um, unclear, but yet Tony, there are many different forms of strength. Absolutely. And I do think that's one of the things that we're seeing here. And to me, it's, it's, it's sort of particularly poignant as we've been going through this. Frodo feels totally overmatched, right? I mean, there's no way that the hobbits did not leave Weathertop feeling strong, right? They did not leave Weathertop feeling like we showed them, right? You try that again, Witch King, and we'll give you some more, right? The, the Witch King is like, what the heck is it with these little guys, right? I mean, I can't, I get, they're telling me off on their front doorsteps, right? They can't, I mean, you know, even to come 17, to, surely he's a wraith by now. Are you kidding me, right? I mean, he's like one frustration after another with these little hobbit creatures, but it's not like the Hobbit creatures are getting uppity, right, or getting cocky about this. They don't feel strong. They're not even aware that they're winning or at least doing super well, right? It's one of the reasons why Gandalf has to has to say it, right? Has to emphasize it. Um, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, did you just ask uh, how long would Lobelia have been able to bear the the, the splinter? Less long, I think. Less long. Lobelia uh, is um, has spiritual issues, right? Uh, I think that her, uh, you know, when you go around with a face that would curdle new milk uh, routinely, right, um, uh, and you're like have become completely focused on your grievances, I bet you would succumb to it much more quickly, right? But I like to think that later Lobelia, right, the Lobelia at the end of the story, uh, you know, before her death, would would uh, have been able to bear the splinter much, much longer, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. But I agree. And Mike was thinking the same thing. post lock hole, Lobelia, exactly. Much more able to. Um, but Mike, I agree. That is part of the Hobbit strength. Their unawareness is part of that strength. I think that seems, um, uh, that seems very likely. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, Valora, I agree. She'd have marched to Mordor to give Sauron a piece of her mind. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, 
I'm a little bit sorry we don't get the chance to see Lobelia up and go for one of the ring wraiths with her umbrella. Um, but, you know. Um, anyway. Okay. Um, I agree, by the way, with whoever said it a while back. Um, Lincoln, was it you? That Gandalf um, seems like he's speculating when he says, I've known strong warriors of the big people who would quickly have been overcoming. I don't think this is, uh, this is based on... Um, you know, carefully measured experiments, right? I, I think that he's estimating here, but he is really emphasizing this point, right? And so notice Gandalf is pointing to exactly what we've been talking about, right? Strength is not always what it looks like. Strong warriors of the big people. Um, so not just big people who seem to be much stronger than you little people, right? Than you hobbits, um, but warriors of the big people. And not just warriors of the big people, strong warriors of the big people, right? So the extreme end of um, of big people strength, right? You know, 18 slash 00 strength, uh, they would have been overcome by it. So the, the largest outward strength, apparent strength. And this, I think, makes it clear that when he says uh, to when he says something like hobbits fade very reluctantly, he's not just talking about physical strength, physical resilience, right? It's not about physiology. It's about, it's about their spirits. It's about psychology. It's about, um, as I say, their spirits, not about their, um, uh, their physical persons. Um, yeah, and I agree, Lincoln, in many ways, The Hobbit's weakness is one of their greatest assets over the course of the trilogy. It's one of the paradoxes. It's one of the, the really interesting and important morals, right? That kind of paradoxical strength in weakness. Um, you know, the power of humility is one of the things that Tolkien, I do think, is depicting uh, in this story. Um, yeah, Um yeah. Um, awesome. Rococo is talking about how uh, all of this discourse about the importance of spiritual fortitude and mindset and outlook is uh, uh, affecting her everyday life positively. Awesome. Yeah. I, you know, there are a lot. There are many, many people who have found Tolkien to be a very wholesome force in their own lives. Right. And I, I you can certainly see uh, how this kind of stuff uh, uh, happens. Yeah. And oh, Veronica, you're so right. The bigger they are, the harder they fall in spiritual warfare. Right. And we see that again and again. Right. Who falls hardest? The greatest. Right. Uh, you know, the 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 great warrior, the Feanors. Right. The Morgoths. Those are the ones who who fall hardest. Um, yeah. Anyway. OK. Um, yeah, good. All right. Um, let's, uh, I have an idea. Let's do the next slide. What would they have done to me? Asked Frodo. What were the riders trying to do? They tried to pierce your heart with a morgul knife, which remains in the wound. If they had succeeded, you would have become like they are only weaker and under their command. You would have become a wraith under the dominion of the dark Lord, and he would have tormented you for trying to keep his ring if any greater torment were possible than being robbed of it and seeing it on his hand. Thank goodness I did not realize the horrible danger, said Frodo faintly. I was mortally afraid, of course, but if I had known more, I should not have dared even to move. It is a marvel that I escaped. Yes, fortune or fate have helped you, said Gandalf, not to mention courage, for your heart was not touched, and only your shoulder was pierced. And that was because you resisted to the last. But it was a terribly narrow shave, so to speak. You were in gravest peril while you wore the ring, for then you were half in the wraith world yourself, and they might have seized you. You could see them, and they could see you. I know, Mike, there's so much to talk about on this slide, isn't there? Whew, I'm not even sure we'll be able to finish this slide tonight. Uh, let's try to get at least through... Hang on. So let's not talk about that last paragraph. Okay, I want to save that. We might not get to it. I want to talk about the top part first. Okay. Um, uh, yes, Lincoln, I was thinking the same thing. Lincoln says, And thus is Gildor in glory and vindicated for keeping knowledge of the riders from Frodo. I wonder if Frodo is actually alluding to that. 
right? He was the one, remember, who said to Gildor, I can't imagine what information would be more terrifying than your hints and warnings, right? And now he's like, um, okay, now I, now I know what information would be more terrifying. But I don't believe it. I, I think that Frodo is either wrong or if he had known more, he should not have dared even to move. I, I don't think that that's true. Um, I think that he has a, a, a lower than accurate opinion of what he actually would have done. Um, I still tend to side with Frodo in his conversation with Gildor rather than Frodo here in his conversation with Gandalf. Um, uh, yeah. Um, Yeah, Valori. <laughs> Valori's uh, thinking about the uh, um, the irony of uh, the phrase "terribly narrow shave" between two people who don't shave. I think "narrow" means it's not thinking about uh, shaving your face, uh, but about a a, a a narrow shave, meaning uh, slipping between two like rocks that are really close together, uh, right? So it's um. Um, like a scrape. Anyway. Um, but yes, Tony, I do think what we're seeing here is Frodo's humility. Um, that's what I mean when I say I don't believe him. Um, I, I, and I, I, I say that meaning nothing but well, right? Um, uh, it's this, I do not believe to be a true statement, but I do think that Frodo believes it, right? That this is an expression of Frodo's humility in that way. Um, what would they have done to me? What were the riders trying to do? Let's think about that question for a second. One thing is perfectly clear, right? They wanted the ring, the ring, the ring, they were saying, right? Like that's okay. Yeah. They wanted the ring. Um, but Frodo is, um, uh, is asking, uh, what would they have done to me? Why the two questions? Why is he asking the same thing twice? What should, what would they have done to me? What were the riders trying to do? Why does he say it twice? I, my initial reaction there is that the difference between those two questions is imaginative proximity. That is, what would they have done to me is totally theoretical, right? In theory, what would they have done? And the second one, what were the writers trying to do is much closer, right? Almost like he's sort of realizing, yeah, no, wait, hang on a second. I asked that like it was like it's a theoretical, right? I need to be realistic here. It's not just about what would they have done. They were doing something. What was it exactly that they were trying to do? Almost like he's kind of reconciling himself, like he can't, he's still wrapping his own mind around it, right? What would they have done to me is more, it's like, it's more, more, it's more theoretical. It's more academic, right? In principle, what would the ring wraiths do to their victims, right? And then he's like, no, no, wait, let me, let me come at that again. What were they trying to do to me? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, just how, exactly the difference between Frodo asking a lore question and Frodo saying, just how much danger was I in, right? Um, Frodo is really kind of confronting that, I think, in an important way. Again, he's just been told... Don't be alarmed. It's gone now. It, it has been melted. Right. And his response is to be like, what would they have done? Um, and then he, again, kind of refocus, refocuses that. Um, yeah. Oh, now that's interesting, Mike. Mike says he's comforted that he's not thinking about the ring here explicitly. Yeah. Yeah. I, that is interesting. Um yeah, 
And Matt, you're right. It does also stress that uh, uh, something that is becoming increasingly clear, roughing him up and taking the ring wasn't an option. There was a darker plan. Yes. What were the writers trying to do? Well, let's take this in the context of uh, Gandalf's answer. They tried to pierce your heart with a morgul knife which remains in the wound. If they had succeeded, you would have become like they are, only weaker and under their command. You would have become a wraith under the dominion of the Dark Lord. This is what they were trying to do. To pierce your heart, you would have become like they are. You would become a wraith like they are. Under the dominion of the Dark Lord, he would have tormented you for trying to keep his ring if any greater torment were possible than being robbed of it and seeing it on his hand. Um, yes. Aragorn says this uh, quote makes the broken bit of the blade seem intentional. Yes, I agree. I agree. Um, but it also kind of seems like a failsafe. They tried to pierce your heart with a Morgul knife. That's true in two senses. Right? That is, he tried to pierce your heart like that's what he was aiming for when he stabbed at you. He was trying just to... The, the plan wasn't, I'm going to nick him in the shoulder and then we'll let it work its way inward over the course of a couple, two, three weeks and, and then it will pierce his heart. That wasn't plan A, right? Plan A is stab to the heart, right? But the splinter appears to be a kind of failsafe, right? I'm, I'm going for the heart, but... Should I miss the heart? It's fine, right? I just gotta, I just gotta stab him somewhere, and uh, you know this can, uh, this can, this can work its way in, right? Um, yes. Good. Oh, lots of, uh, lots of really great comments here. Um, Tony says it's almost like therapy. He's overcoming his fear and trauma uh, by facing it directly. Yeah, in, in, in his questions there, yes. Um, what were the writers trying to do? Um, what he says, uh, Tony, I think about his reaction again there. Thank goodness I did not realize the horrible danger. I was mortally afraid, but if I had known more, I should not have dared even to move. Um, he is confronting what happened, right? He is confronting, um, thank goodness I did not realize the danger. Um, if I had known more, I'm still thinking about the verbs, right? The verb moods and tenses and voices here. Um, if I had known more, um, Tony, as you're saying, he, he does now know more. He is processing what he is now learning. He is now looking back on what happened uh, and working through what this all means, right? What were they trying to do? What kind of danger was I was in, was I in? One of the ways in which he's sort of processing that is projecting back this theoretical paralysis, right? I am terrified to learn about this, but I am distancing myself from that terror, right? I am imagining my past self being confronted with this information and being paralyzed with fear. My present self is not paralyzed by that fear, right? Because I am now looking at that and I'm no longer in that danger, right? I've experienced that and moved past that. Um, but, you know, boy, my past self would have been, it seems to be part of kind of processing it, right? Not just deflecting it, not just being like, well, I won't worry about that now. Well, bygones, right? Uh, you know, I've been healed now, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, he is still kind of thinking it through, right? He is, I was about to say taking it to heart, which seems an ironic thing to say under the circumstances. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Arden Cran was saying maybe Sauron doesn't trust the Witch King to act as double ring bearer. Well, yeah. Um, so there are a couple things here. First, I'm focusing. Is to, I, I really like Tony's comment there. I want to focus on sort of Frodo thinking through this, right? Sit, watching Frodo grapple with this. But there are several other kinds of things that we learn here, right? 
why why is this the plan um the plan is clearly not to just take the ring from frodo right um their plan is to turn him into a wraith under their command and under the dominion of the dark lord And then Frodo is to be brought to Sauron. And then the ring will be taken from him, presumably by Sauron himself. And then Sauron will be tormented. So Sauron's going to take the ring away and torture him. The worst torture of which is to see him, um, see the ring on Sauron's hand. Um, Yeah. Um, <laughs> JJ is wondering if Sauron already suspects how awesomely fearsome hobbits are and is planning on halfling wraiths as his ultimate weapon. No. No. We can. I think we can prove that that's not the case, JJ. Primarily because... Um, he doesn't the strength that they have right the particular species of awesomeness that hobbits have is precisely the kind of awesomeness that Sauron does not uh, value or even perceive I think really um, <laughs> Mike thinks maybe the witch king has thought of it now right maybe maybe um, maybe I don't know though uh, I, I, I think he's frustrated, but I'm not sure he gets it. Why? Uh, uh, wherein that strength lies, right? Um, yes, Oakfen, I do believe that the implication, my reading of this is that the implication is that Frodo would have borne the ring all the way to Mordor. I don't think that the Witch King was going to take the ring away. Remember, this is also implied in at the ford, right? Come back to Mordor, we will take you, right? Um, the ring wraiths came not to seize the ring and deliver the ring directly, carry the ring to Sauron. They came to escort the ring to Sauron. That seems to be the plan. Um, at least that's what Gandalf seems to be telling us here. Um, are we able to conclude firmly that the Witch King couldn't or shouldn't or that Sauron doesn't want him to? That seems to me going a step too far. Um, I don't think we can prove those things. We might suspect those things, but I'm not sure we can prove those things. What does seem to be clear, I think it's fairly clear anyway, is that Frodo was going to bear the ring the whole way. Um, and this it seems to me fitting in more than one way, right? Um, fitting in that it, it seems to fit what they said with, you know, they talk about bringing him to Mordor, uh, and Gandalf here also talks about them bringing him to Mordor. Um, also there's an appealing sort of, uh, uh, irony to it. Um, it, that seems to fit, that seems to work, right? Um, The Nazgul compelling him to be a ring bearer who bears the ring to Mordor in order to deliver it to Sauron, right? And Luke, I think you're thinking along similar lines here. Um, that's a horrible irony, right? And that kind of horrible irony feels to me exactly right, right? Um, it is Frodo's fate to be a ring bearer, to bear the ring to Mordor. That's how his path is laid, right? There are a couple different ways in which that could pan out, right? But that's going to happen one way or another. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Um, Ambrosius Aurelianus, I don't know what kind of power Frodo would have. 
I don't think Frodo would have any power from the ring. If he bears the ring to Mordor under their command, I don't think he would have any power from the ring over them. Um, I don't think so. He's under their command. Um, and to in order to be able to like tap the ring really the the power of the ring to dominate the will of others you've got to claim it right you have to put a claim in on it and that requires will right your independent will to claim the ring um Gollum is a slave to the ring but he's not a slave to Sauron right his will is to claim the ring for himself in defiance of Sauron. Not for you, right? He's going to shout, shaking his fist towards the east, right? Um, if Frodo were wraithified, if he becomes under the command of the, of the Nazgul and under the dominion of the Dark Lord, he is not going to have the will to claim the ring and therefore use it in any way. Um, I just don't see that happening. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, Ambrosia says this is what he's worried, that what Boromir is worried about, right? That they'll just be delivering the ring to Sauron. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, there's that irony that sort of runs through it, right? Um yeah. Yeah, exactly. The exercise will and the exercise of will. That's what the power of the ring is, Tony, as you say. Exactly. If he has no will left, he can't use the ring by definition. That's what he is a victim of the ring, uh, uh, the subject of the ring, not its master anymore. Um, yes, yes. Um, yes, he doesn't claim the ring. The ring claims all of the wraiths. He would be the slave to the ring and therefore to its lord, right? And under his dominion. Um, yes. Um, oh, yeah, Rococo, totally. For, she said, Frodo's journey to Mordor is so difficult because he resisted the ring the entire way. Would it have been easier as a wraith? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And until the ring is taken away. Yeah, absolutely. No, um... Again, back to the ford, right? Come back to Mordor, we will take you. There is a sense in which that's a real offer, right? Wouldn't it be easier, right? Doesn't it? Doesn't this hurt? Isn't this unpleasant? This you may as well come quietly, right? Come back to Mordor with us. We'll take you to Mordor. Um, all you have to do is submit, and everything will be easy after that, right? I, I think there's an element of that that we can see there. Um, yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I missed who said this before, but I saw it flash by briefly. Um, you're right that the uh, line, if any greater torment were possible than being robbed of it and seeing it on his hand. Um, that's. Uh, um, that's. Makes us think should make us think of Gollum, right? And Gollum's experience. Yes. Now, Gollum is still not experiencing that ultimate torment. It's not on Sauron's ring or Sauron's finger. Right. Um, it's the irrevocability of that comparative irre relative rel irrevocability. Right. Um, I mean, it was revoked once before. Right. The ring was cut off of Sauron's hand previously by Isildur. But unless another Isildur comes along and I don't know anybody who's anything like that, then uh, that ain't happening. Um but still, I mean, that that's the greatest torment, right, is to see Sauron possess it in his power again. Um, if, uh, you know, a thief of a Baggins has it, it's still potentially recoverable. So that's still a torment, but it's not the greatest torment yet. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so... Boomful, you raise an interesting question. The wraiths have no will of their own left either, speaking of wills. 
Well, I mean, yes, they're his servants, right? They're certainly bound to Sauron, no question, but I wonder. Again, the Witch King seems to exert his will. Um, I don't think... I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think that uh, to say that they have no will doesn't seem to me quite right. I, I, I mean, are they absolutely enslaved? Um, is their slavery absolute? Yes, certainly in the sense of being inescapable, right? I don't think that the ring wraiths are redeemable. Um, I don't think that it's worthwhile trying to appeal to the ring wraiths and be like, throw off the yoke of Sauron and become a good guy again. Like, again, I don't think that that's on the table. In that sense, they are absolute slaves uh, of the ring and of the ring's master. But I think they act independently. I think that the Witch King is a free agent in Again, not ultimately, but as far as like the exertion of his will and his choices and what he's doing, I don't think it is his will. His power is an extension is is, you know, a gift slash curse right from Sauron. So it's all derived from the enemy. Right. Um, notice how we saw that back in the previous slide. Right. The weapons of our enemy are deadly. So the will of the Witch King as manifested in this blade is the will of Sauron, right? So there is, uh, you know, some blurring there, some identification, but I don't think, I think I can't see the Witch King in particular as merely robots, right? As just puppets of the will of Sauron. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, they must respond to the will of their master. Yeah. Um, but again, that's different from saying they have no will of their own, right? Their will is totally subjected to the will of Sauron, right? Their will is subordinated. When he calls, they come. When he commands them, they obey. Um, but I don't think that that necessarily means that they're like you know, the seven fathers of the dwarves before Iluvatar's intervention, you know. Um, yeah, they uh, Luke says they have the will to act independently so long as their acts align with that of their lord. Yeah, I don't think rebellion is off the table. I don't think that they can rebel. I think that their slavery is in that sense absolute. But again, will is tricky because I think that we do see um, the will. I, I, I know for a fact we're going to see this later on. Um the Witch King is going to be asserting his will, not Sauron's will, right? Not himself as age. He is not the mouth of Sauron, right? Um, think of the difference between I am the mouth of Sauron and old fool, this is my hour, right? The Witch King is asserting his own will um, and his own power. Does he serve Sauron? Yeah. Is he a faithful servant? Yeah. Uh, can he rebel and set up on his own? No. But again, you know, I don't know. I uh, I think that they clearly have will. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Frumius Bujum says it's almost like a twisted version of everybody being bound to Iluvatar's will. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in a sense, though, again, it works very differently. Frumius, here's how I would think about that. The binding of the Nazgul's will to Sauron is to the binding of everybody else's actions to Iluvatar's will as the uh, braying of many trumpets on one note in Melkor's music is to the beauty and complexity of the music of the Ainur, right? Um, that is to say, when Melkor set up on his own and tried to do his own music, it's not just that it conflicted with the music of Iluvatar, it also sucked, 
right? It was bad music. It was simplistic music, right? Trying to be himself and set himself up and do his own thing. The thing that he did was not as good, right? The full richness even of his own being, even of his own will and personality could only really be manifest in harmony with Iluvatar and with his Melkor's brethren, right? Um, so too, the kind of binding of the will here, it's crude, it's simplistic. Um, it's not like the kind of relationship that Iluvatar's will has with others. Um, but again, there's that kind of parallel there, right? So in what sense is his will theirs? And Boomful, I do acknowledge your quotation from Unfinished Tales there um, about uh, the ring, how the Ringwraith had no will but his own, Sauron's own, each being each utterly subservient to the ring that had enslaved him, which Sauron held. Yes. But again, um, had no will but his own, again, I don't think means they're robots. Like, that, that you know, that Sauron is out in Baradur maneuvering them by remote control, right? That would be one reading of had no will but his own. I th again, I think that's demonstrably untrue when we look at the story. However, um, the way that I would interpret that, Boomful, is that when, it, when, it, when Tolkien says they had no will but his own, um, the Ringwraith had no will but Sauron's own, it meant like they're, like, they're they do his bidding, right? Um, they're 100% on his team. Um, they are following orders. Uh, they are compelled to do what he wants them to do. But they, the reason they are such powerful servants is that they do also have the ability to exercise their own wills and think on their feet, right? As the Witch King has tried to do. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Tony... I tend to agree with you that the Ringwraiths didn't realize they were being subjugated while it was happening, that they just made one bad decision after another until there was no turning back. Uh, yeah, kind of like, Tony, we see in Numenor, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I think it would be really fun to depict the fall of the, you know, those great kings of men uh, who became the Nazgul, right? Um It's one of the reasons I get so annoyed at the pitiful backstory for the uh, uh, the Nazgul that are given to them in that stupid Shadows of Mordor game. Um, it's not just that it's like wrong. I mean, it is, but it's not just that. It's that it's simple. It's dumb. I mean, it's uh, their I, concept of how you become a ringwraith uh, is puerile. It drives me crazy. Um, uh, but anyway. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, let's see. Matt asks, um, if Gandalf is concerned that he might not win if he went one-on-one -on -one against the Witch King, would the Witch King not be a potential rival to Sauron if he claimed the One Ring? See, Matt, that's exactly how I would think that enslavement of the will is manifested. Right. I think that the Witch King can is driving the bus. Right. He's making his own decisions. He's able to exert his own will. But I don't think he can do that. I think that's off the table. I do not think that it is possible for the Ringwraiths to rebel against Sauron. Um, and honestly, Boomfall, as you pointed out, you know, I, I see that you noticed that that was that your quote there was a quote from Unfinished Tales. You said, Oops, that's Unfinished Tales. But you see exactly that. I think that. That's one of the things that he's addressing. We see him working through some questions. You know, sometimes it's explicit, sometimes it's not explicit, right? One of the things that is fun, I find fun to do in Unfinished Tales, is like you read bits of Unfinished Tales and you ask and 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 you you play the game that says, "What question was Tolkien answering, right, when he wrote this? Like, what's the." What's the what's the point in a sense, right? What what question or uncertainty is this meant to uh, to clear up? And boomful, one of the things that I would put behind that is exactly something like uh, like Matt's um, uh, point, right? Wouldn't it have been possible 
if the Witch King is on Gandalf's level, and Gandalf is clearly one of the people that uh, that the the that Sauron you know would fear if he took up the ring, why wouldn't the Witch King? Why wouldn't it be possible for the Witch King? And I think that that quote, boomful that you made from Unfinished, is part of his answer to that, right? No, not on the table, right? They are their wills are dominated by are, are enslaved by their rings, right? He owns them, he controls them. They can't set their will against his. Um, yeah, exactly, Fourth Donalus. There's no way he would have sent them after the one had that been a, a realistic possibility, right? Sauron's just going to roll the dice on that. Um, uh, and again, that seems to me very likely to be one of the very questions or objections or uncertainties that Tolkien was trying to clear up when he said that in Unfinished Tales about the enslavement of their, um, of their wills. Um, Curry says, if by fun, I mean like really sad and dark. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of what I mean by it would be fun to depict the fall of the Nazgul. Um, yeah, fun in the sense of interesting to work through what that, what the kind of spiritual process that Tolkien implies actually looked like, right? Yes. That's what I mean by fun. Also really sad and dark. Definitely. Um, Yeah. Uh, yeah, good. Um, Veronica, I am tempted to reply to your comment by speculating about how exactly my interest in that differs from the kinds of things we see depicted in Game of Thrones and the manner in which we see them depicted. But I am going to resist that particular uh, uh, digression. Um, uh, <laughs> Corey says, the, or Karina says, the Corey definition of fun is going to make people question what exactly is fun at Moots. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Nader Moon is going to be fun, not in the sense of people are going to experience tragic moral decline, <laughs> which we'll get to observe and discuss. That's that's not the flavor of fun that we have uh, at Moots. Yeah, though talking about that <laughs> is a kind of fun that we could sometimes have. Uh, uh, perfectly fair point, Karita. I, I agree. Um Anyway, okay, all right. Um, okay, let's stop there. Let's stop there. Um, we got through like one and two thirds of a slide today. I want to come back to the, make sure I don't move off this slide for next time. I might accidentally uh, make sure I don't. Um, I want to come back to that last paragraph, which actually makes a lot of sense. In the, I was saving. I didn't want to start with that because I knew that that was going to uh, slide into the next slide, which, so to speak, which is um, more about the nature of the ring rates and what wraithification means and the you know, and then moving on towards the discussion of the other side, right, and Glorfindel. So um, we'll kind of look at more of the, like, metaphysics of the thing, uh, right? Having looked at uh, Frodo's wound itself and the splinter and, and another... Uh, Rococo, thank you so much for your question, and I know, Harnoth, you were uh, thinking the same thing at almost exactly the same time. Um, uh uh, anyway, thank you for asking that question. I don't even know that I ever would have questioned my own, like, um, uh, you know, unconscious assumptions about that passage if you hadn't asked that. That was really awesome. Um, uh, anyway, so this seems, although we're in the middle of a slide, this seems like a, this seems like a good place to stop. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, thanks everybody for, uh, uh, for joining me tonight for this. We're going to have our field trip now. Um, I'm going to, uh, turn off Twitter, which is half working at least the half which seems to be broadcasting so i'll i'll settle for it even though it's hard to read people's comments um but anyway um so we're going to move on so i'm going to say goodbye to the twitter folks feel free to join us at twitch.tv slash signum you and we are going to be here next week so uh just a quick reminder we will do uh class next week on tuesday the whatever day that is 16th 
right? And then I'll be gone the week after. So the 23rd, we won't have class on the 23rd, but we will have class on the 16th, and then we'll be back again uh, on the 30th uh, of April. Maybe. Good probably. Evening. Probably. Anyway. Hey, Valori, <laughs> how's it going? Uh, so, so bye, Twitter, folks. Thank you. So, yes, I just got back from a convention. We were talking uh, about the villains of Lord of the Rings, and we were kind of speculating whether we were going to see any falls of uh, any particular people in the Numenor storyline. So, yeah, well, you know, um, I will be interested to see if they end up trying to fold that in. Um, I certainly hope that they don't. Okay, well, so. <laughs> I hope that they're not simplistic about that. And I have, I have some reason for, for, for hope here. Um, when I say oh, simplistic, yeah. I mean, collapsing this second and, 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 and the, you know, like, let's not have our Farazon become the witch King is the main thing that I'm saying here. Right. Yeah. Um, if the, if the, our Farazon and the other leaders of the King's men in Numenor at the mm-hmm. downfall of Numenor, just become ring wraiths. Um, I'll be disappointed. I'll be disappointed because that's a shortening of the story, right? That's a simplification of things. The yeah, way that that's he at corrupts, least a whole season's worth. <laughs> exactly. And the way that he corrupts the Numenorians and sort of the Numenorian culture is like a, a model, right? I mean, it's like a demo for what he does with the ring rates, uh, but it's, yeah. it's, it's played out on a different level. Uh, and I hope they don't try to just elide those two things. My my cause for hope is the mere fact that they seem to be perfectly willing to take their time with this, right? I mean, if if their idea of starting at the beginning of the Lord of the Rings story is to start at the at you know Eregion and the forging of the Rings of Power, that gives me some hope that they're not going to rush through this thing, right? Um, yeah, it's like are they going to start with Anatar and Celebrimbor? That's that's the yeah, thing exactly. On my mind, exactly. Um, so, um, anyway, I, I'm not saying I, I I'm going to think it's horrible if there is like a, you know, a Numenorian, a second age Numenorian, uh, you know, mm-hmm. from the Island of Numenor among the ring wraiths. Um, I'm not saying I think it would be an abomination for them to do that or anything. Again, I'm just hoping they don't <laughs> collapse the two stories, right? The, the corruption of the nine Kings of men to make them ring wraiths is one story. The, corruption and perversion and the bringing about the, the ultimate fall of the society of Numenor is a different story. And they're parallel. Like there's lots of connections between them, uh, but they're not the same story. And I, I hope they don't just kind of slide them in together. That's all. That's I all. hope not, but I'd also understand for the purpose of television, if they decided, to <laughs> I'm not saying it would be it. the worst possible <laughs> thing that could happen. I agree. But, um, all right. Oh, right. So we should probably head to Rivendell. <laughs> All right. Off to Rivendell. Yeah. Off to Rivendell we go. Let's go back to Rivendell. Oh, you have the you have the Rivendell tapestry here with the, the boat. Oh, I don't here think I in noticed the... that before. Where is it? Here oh, the down Laurel. there. Yeah, right. Yeah, down there. The boat. What's that? Is this a... That the looks one... like an eagle in mountains. Yeah, the one on the that. right. Is that a... Is that a... Is that a an Erebor banner? Is that like a raven and I, the yeah? And, and I definitely the think it's is Erebor. That, is, I know these banners are you know like taken from different places in the game. Like we got the Rohan, you know, banners uh-huh. behind, and the you know the the of course the Gondorian banner and uh, the and all shields, that stuff. And the spears. Yeah. Um, so you so know this rad. is a this whole room is sort of you know an, an eclectic gathering of different um, you know stuff from across the world uh it's the lore hall right yeah so it's they, got they, lore saw you, they saw you coming everywhere. yeah exactly <laughs> um let's combine all of his favorite tapestries into one place um yeah yeah and the map walls right love the map walls the this map is walls. like what i wanted in my house someday and then i realized that framing things cost money <laughs> right right um but anyway yeah so uh, does anyone remember in game where that because I know it's not unique to here, like they've taken it from somewhere in games. Anybody remember where the game location is for the eagle or raven plus mountains 
um, thing. I tend to think that it's, I mean, it could be Moria because we've got the three peaks. Um, the it's way definitely the, not Erebor. It's not Erebor? Okay. No, nope. oh, it's not. Okay. not. Well, it might be a proto Erebor design, but they, um, they did refine it somewhat. Uh, there's distinctly different designs for Erebor. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, the, though this room and its decorations do predate, you know, the, the new Erebor. So, yeah, not sure. Anyway, sorry, here I'm getting all distracted and not even leaving the room. It's all your fault, Valeria. I blame you. Okie doke. <laughs> anyway. Um... <laughs> That never happens. Distracted? What? Us? Um, I mean, sorry, there's a reason my company's called Tangent Artists. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so, oh, hey, Trifle, tell me more about that. What do you dislike about Lotro's depiction of Anatar? You're saying that you hope that... Um, they, that is the uh, Amazon people, I assume, you're hoping that they um, start him off morally gray with a secondary fall? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I hear that. I mean, you know, in a sense, of course, I mean, I don't know if, uh, Trifle, if you're following uh, the Silmarillion film project that we do, but, you know, in film film, we made exactly that kind of choice, you know, sort of rolling Melkor's fall back and not making him just already completely fallen before he descends into Middle Earth as he is in the Silmarillion because we wanted to explore and depict that. I could see an Also argument. because conflict is interesting. You know? Well, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, he's he's a source of conflict on his own. It's just, uh, you know, want, we just wanted to explore, like, what makes Morgoth tick. Like, why is he who he is and why does he do what he does? Um, but yeah, anyway, I yeah. uh, I, so, um, everyone's like obscuring the uh, stable master here. I can't. Click so, on same that. thing with that. They wanted to do the same thing with Anatar then? Like, after well, that's what Morgoth's I'm wondering. expulsion? Um, yeah. I don't know, Trifle. I'm not convinced that when Sauron was appearing as Anatar, he was conflicted. Um,. I think yeah, was, I think he'd kind of made up his mind at that. Point. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do, I do get um, uh, trifle. I do get the, you know, the, the how when you know after Morgoth's fall, he Sauron, um, you know, does, you know, we get one of those. It is you know said that or it is not said that you know one of those lines about how. Um, Sauron might possibly have been at least partially in earnest, right, in his repentance uh, after the fall of Morgoth. Um, but I think by the time we get to the forging of the Rings of Power, he's not, you know, he's clearly not earnest anymore. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, yeah, but, no, I, I, no, I'd agree with that. I'd agree with that. I think you'd have to go back further in order to find the redeemable again. But by the time he's uh, saying, I'm going to mess with uh, uh, Regian and Moria and ring forging and all that fun stuff. It's yeah. kind of, kind of well past done to the point where he's in Numenor. He's just having good old fun being a bad guy again. Yeah. I, I mean, I think he's already pretty, but, but though trifle, I do agree that there does seem to be, you know, uh, you could ask the, you could extend the question as trifles. I think you are doing by implication here. You could extend the question that we were talking about with the ring rates earlier today. Um, to what extent is their will free, right? To what extent are they making their own choices and, and able to exert yeah. their own will? You could extend that question to Sauron um, because Sauron's will is also partially enslaved to Morgoth. Um, Exactly. Uh, Trifle is quoting the line where it says, um, um, and then when Aonwe had departed, he hid himself in Middle Earth and fell back into evil, for the bonds Morgoth had laid on him were very strong. Bonds. Yeah. yeah he is yeah. enslaved. Right? Yeah. And it, it, it it's definitely one of those, you know, even after Morgoth was banished to the dimensions, that kind of warping can stay even if the source is gone. And it's and it's clear that his uh, power, Morgoth's power, is still operative in Middle Earth, right? Um, Oops, things jumped. Where are we? Uh, sorry, I went uh, over the. I stopped. 
before the I didn't cross the bridge to the last homely house. Okay, so you're by the spire. Of, oh, there we go. Okay, I am. I'm a little up from the spire. Okay, so I was just getting back because we 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 stopped up this path. This is the path we yeah. were looking at and looking at how there are cobblestones, but it's not well tended and there's no there are no curbs, right? There's no uh, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, we had the sort of the the combination of a a maintained crafted path, but also the natural landscape and how you can look it looks from here like you're almost in the middle of the woods. So this is where we were last time. There's our our gazebo up by the uh, uh, the waterfall up there. Um, I use perception. All right. So now, right. what is this place up here? Let's see. What does the subtitle say? Nothing. Nothing, Nothing at all. On all sides of it? This is a marketplace or something? I thought it was something. No indications of what this is at all? Absolutely none over here. I'm going all the way around to see if I get a little subtitle here. And... Interesting. No. It's, it's okay. just a thing. So... What is that's awesome? I like that even better. Yeah. Um, let's back up this. What is this? That's una cosa. <laughs> let's see. We got a big old Can't double door. Anything. Yeah. We got lots of lights. We got a big tower on the top. Yeah. But it's a closed tower. It's not open to the sky. No, it looks like it's full of glass. Yes. And these, the two wings on either side are like little secondary towers, right? This is a very mm-hmm. towerish kind of building. It's um, also covered with that sort of blooming wisteria stuff all over. Is it a house? or So is this somebody's house or the house of a group of people? I mean, it would stand to reason there'd be some houses around here. Right. But this is a, this is a mansion. This is... Very large. The Lord's house. Elrond with the central tower, the two boys on the other side. Okay, we do have... Like, he doesn't sleep in his house. He has his own little house. Well, uh-oh, I just fell down the cliff. Sorry, I didn't expect to oh, slip so soon. Oh, don't do on. that. That's all right. I'll come back around. <laughs> Professor Gork and Rivendell, and he's not even on a bridge. Exactly. Just Rivendell the cliff. Um, <laughs> coming back around. Okay, here we are. Oh, oh at least it's at... not into roar, roaring water like half of the No, exactly. It was, that was easy. That was we trivial. lucked out. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, and if you're Maybe wondering, by Fendel's the way, house. if you're wondering, by the way, why I keep taking it out of first person mode where you can see better, it's because I don't want to make myself motion sick. Um, okay. But understandable. I only, I only do that when I'm standing still for a reason. Um, yeah, this is a pretty opulent place. I mean, you look at it compared to the size of the guest house. Like. The, the one that Aragorn and Gimli right. and Legolas yes. are staying in this yes. little itty bitty, you know, Motel Six room. Yes, compared and to this. I wonder this. if this is a if this is a um, a, a home at all. Like an administration building? <laughs> no, I'd like to think that it's not. Can I, I can't get around the back here. Right? I just have to be more careful. Um, this definitely looks like some sort of room where they'd be sitting around, looking, needing a great deal of light. Yeah, and lots of windows here, all the way through, and light seeming to shine from within, from all yeah. of them. That happens at nighttime. Yeah, they're they're yeah. very big at burning the candles at both ends out here. Right. Except this part this is the only non-window part. That's interesting. That's where the bathroom is, so you don't look in. I suppose bathhouse here, maybe. Yeah. Um, oh, actually, it looks like the stairwells here because it's another. It's a spire. Yeah. So. Hmm. But someplace that has so, good access to torches, probably. Who lives here? Uh, people are talking about it. You know, uh, you know, Druid's Fire, you're suggesting maybe it could be Elrond's house itself. It's possible. I don't know why he wouldn't live in the last homely house. Um, well, it's like Boomful said in Twitch. He works in the library, not from home. <laughs> right. So he commutes huh. to the last homely house, uh, you know, to yeah. work. Well, you consider how long it took us to go on the scale of the map, though. That would mean he would, you know, ride half a day's journey to go to work. That's true. Or, uh, yeah, the 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 scale. Maybe this well, is where. I mean, yeah. the scale is always hard, right? I mean, it's like when yeah. you think about how long it takes you to run from one end of 
Minas Tirith to the other, you know, would lead you to believe mm-hmm. that, you know, Minas Tirith is as far across as it is from, you know, Hobbiton to Stock, which Well, is it was just something you brought true, up when, but... when we looked at the auction house. Does the same rules apply? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe this is where mummy-in-law stays when she comes to visit. Yeah, I think not. Um... It's the, it's the in-law house. Well, <laughs> so are there other... I'm trying... So what, what I'm trying to conclude here is, again, yeah, as I was saying last time, my examination of... Um, uh, my examination of the landscape of... of, uh, uh, of Rivendell here, what I'm really interested in is seeing how the Lotro people are imagining elf culture and high elf culture mm-hmm. in particular as, as Rivendell is what is the, the one yeah, place the in Middle Earth that is primarily associated with the Noldor. Um, mm-hmm. So anyway. So, so um, I'm noticing it's like, we're, we're nowhere near the market mm-hmm. and we're nowhere near the, the, the spire of meeting and we're nowhere near the, this is um, the middle of nowhere. It's, we are in the middle of nowhere. We're not near yes. any, the guardhouse. We're not in any strategic positions. Yeah. So, I mean, looking um, at the map here, this, the area near the stable master, you know, near the, um, you know, the, the crafting area, right? Uh, like this is the, that, that's like the town, like the village area, right? With all of mm-hmm. the, um, uh, the, the, you know, and just across the river there from the stable, um, this is isolated from all of that, right? Um, separated from the last homely house. And Maybe Arwen from... stayed here? Maybe. Well, what I'm wondering is if this might not be the house of a, a different elf lord, right? Like, remember... Gilbert... Maybe this is where Estel grew up. Maybe. But I tend to think... So he- here's what I'm thinking. Gildor Inglorian says, I'm Gildor Inglorian of the House of Finrod, right? Mm-hmm. Do Noldor of the House of Finrod live here, for instance? Right? Well, what's you know, the crest on here? I don't think we get a crest exactly, do we? I think it's is it just a design? My I point, don't know. It's just a thought. <laughs> right, my point is not that I think we can necessarily um, we can necessarily decide. Uh, what I'm saying is a grand house separated from the others are they imagining that there's still a kind of cohesiveness or to say the same thing in a different way a division right still among the elves not not division in the sense that there's rivalry or bad Mm -hmm. blood or anything like that but that they still can just as the Noldor established different realms for themselves, right? And so you have the people of Finrod who have sworn to follow Finrod down in Argothrond, and you've got, you know, the people of Carinthir up by the mountains and whatever. Um, do we still have that reflected? Is 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 that what they're trying to imply? Um, the, it, the it's big in, enough, yeah. It's almost another second homely house, probably. Well, you know? That's what I'm so. thinking because it's so big and so grand and so separated. From that, and I think back to the discussions also that we had with Gorfindel's words, uh, right mm-hmm. when he says that he is, uh, uh, when he identifies himself that he dwells. Uh, the, wait, what was that phrase? I'm, I, I'm, I'm not going to get the words right. I'm too uh. tired. I think to get the words right just now. What Gorfindel says about himself, and we talked about that a couple months back. Um, what's the phrase? Somebody look it up for me. What is? What does he say? Um, uh, um, that I am of the he doesn't say house of anyway somebody yeah it's like he's of that. the house of blank 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 where Elrond was yeah it, wasn't that it yeah yeah something like there anyway. was a distinctive different there's difference between the two somebody find phrases that. I disbelieve that this is like, you know, you could say this is like Elrond's mm-hmm. summer home out here, right? You know, this is his house in the country and the last homely house is his house in town. Oh, where the climate is so different. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't think that that's the case. I think this mm-hmm. is somebody separate. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's a I I, I like this theory, and I'm, I'm that, I support like it. A, a separate. So again, just in the textual support for this is in Gildor's declaration of himself, right? His describing himself, you know, I'm of the house of Finrod. Well, what the heck difference does that mean? Finrod has been dead for a long time, right? You know, Finrod has yeah. been like, Finrod hasn't had a, ha- had a house in middle earth for mm-hmm. quite some time. Um, the fact that he still identifies himself that way suggests that among the elves, right? Among the high elves uh, who, you know, have a base here in Rivendell, they still divide themselves up that way. They still think about themselves that way. Um, not even just Noldor and Sindar, but among the Noldor, right? Um, which subset of the Noldor are you, Gildor? I'm of the House of Finrod, right? So so again, would this be that kind of thing? Would this reflect that kind of division? Not in a negative way, exactly, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, cousins need their own houses, you know. It, it, it's it's definitely you know as as great and harmonious this place is. You still need boundaries in order to keep your sanity and to you know have a little <laughs> privacy. Well, it's you know they are not, or it's all it's almost like they. I don't know. Well, in Lothlorien, everyone gets here. different houses and flats and stuff like that. So, but it's more. There's more of a sense of one community in Lothlorien. They're they're within the true. same walls, right? And it's more like different houses on different streets. It, you know, you know, I'm speaking metaphorically, right? Um, yes. In Lothlorien, whereas here, again, this is in the a boondocks. refuge. Yeah, almost yeah. like a. Re- but again, I, I mean, I, you know, it's. You can joke Gather about refugees it. from all over. Well, sure, yeah. but it's not like it's a ref- it's a refuge from the rest of Rivendell. Well, the point that I'm trying to make is that it's separated from the rest of of Rivendell, right? Yeah, um, it, it strikes me as very much Elrond saying to them, "Look, here's an area. There's nothing here. Right. Build your house here and you stay guys with can us be in safety." You, right? Exactly. Yeah. Like you know, you you can come and join our join us in Rivendell. Rivendell is the refuge for you. Uh, Druid's Fire, as you say, like the refugees from many places end up in Rivendell, but, um, but you can still have your space, right? We're not, mm-hmm. you know, that the suggestion, again, if my reading of this unnamed house, uh, this unnamed building is correct, would be that um, Rivendell is not a melting pot from an Elvish point of view, Right. Um, they still maintain their own identities and, and even sort of live separately, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, it's yeah. a kinship oh, house. So, no, wait, no, Harnoth, not the uh, not Gildor's quotation. I'm looking for Glorfindel's quotation, the business Glorf where house. he talks about be, uh, his relationship with Rivendell and with Elrond. That's the quote I'm looking for. Um, mm. This is Gorfindel who dwells in the house of Elrond, said Strider. Thanks, Luke. That's that's yeah, the point yeah. I was thinking. That's, of. Yeah, who that dwells the in one. the house of Elrond? That's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Thus implying that he is not of the house of Elrond. That he ha- but he, he, he lives hangs out there. there. Um, but yes. notice where he hangs out is in the house of Elrond. Right. He's so he's not identifying himself separately, but he's not identifying. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Which makes one. him sound that's like one. an exception to the rule. Right. Right. Um, of people who are not of his house but dwell with him. Right, exactly. And we see him standing near the house of Elrond, right? The physical house of Elrond here in game. You tell me he lives on that bench? Which is interesting. Well, no, like again, in the sense of like, I am I am affiliated with the house of Elrond, but I am not, I don't identify myself with it, right? The fact that he's standing out back in the garden is kind of an interesting, uh, you know, I'm not saying that that's what they were shooting for. And that's, you know, the interpretation of that passage, which underlay his position in that place in the game. So I'm, I'm just, just saying it kind of works on that funny, bench. you know, amusingly. Like, like he's like a homeless guy in a park. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Poor guy. <laughs> is this the bench that Gorfindel, you know, sleeps on with his, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, with his bottle and a brown paper bag, you know, yeah. No, probably not. Poor guy. Um, yeah. Let's hope, yeah, let's hope he can live in a nice place like that. Well, it says he, he has his own apartment, so let's just, let's go with that theory then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I, 
uh, uh, Trifle and Tony have continued their discussion about Sauron's moral fall, which is really cool. And I'm trying not to be completely engrossed in your discussion that the two of you are having. Um, I want to say, like, uh, you know, this actually sounds like a wonderful panel that you panel discussion that you guys should have sometime. By the way, the discussion that you guys are having right now is exactly the kind of thing I love doing most. We talk about the kind of fun that I have at Moots. That's the kind of fun I like to have at Moots. That kind of discussion of that sort of question is uh, mm-hmm. uh, is really cool. It's the kind. Oh yeah. We didn't talk about I, that I'm, topic. I'm, yeah. but it's the kind of discussion no. we had at Sunshine Moot just recently. Yeah, Raven Khan, I'm so happy whenever I get into a discussion about the morality of orcs. That's yeah. just every single time something new comes to the table. Yeah. <laughs> no, by all means, Tony, keep going. I, I want to, uh, you know, again, like I, I, I'm keen to uh, yes. see, I, you know, I, 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 you know again, I, I, I'd love to have you guys uh, come to a moot and continue this discussion. Um, yeah, and there will always be calls for papers. Exactly. Exactly. Um, okay. Let's not go down there. Let's go up here. Oh, to the guardhouse. Yeah, because this is the other building. Looking at the map here, right? This is the other building. The only building that is more out in the middle of the boondocks than the one we were just looking at. Yes. Well, and arguably the guest house that Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli are staying in is also fairly mm-hmm. boondockified. In fact, uh arguably possibly even more so let's look at this so we have here pastoral a, a gate right okay so we have a gate yeah. with guards and and the and the um swan zone yeah i was just looking at their yeah uh little breastplate action there um like the green stone set in their in the middle of their halberds there right that's cool mm-hmm. um yeah, we got the what the egrets or uh, cranes here on either side of the, which look like they yep. should be phoenixes, but probably yep. aren't. Um, yes, egrets. There we go. Yeah. Interesting that the guards are facing in and not facing out. That is interesting, isn't it? I, I well, don't. Well, we got a lot of new visitors coming in. Maybe <laughs> right, exactly. In right, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, that's funny. I always assumed they were watching us. Right. That's. I never knew to say we're always sort of pointing this way. I just assume that us walking around Rivendell, they're trying to keep an eye on us. Because I, yeah. If, well, it's definitely. That... It's almost like they're they're saying, yeah, you can leave if you want, but we're not. Uh, we're not responsible for anything that happens afterwards. Yeah, yeah, um, and of course, I just also find it interesting that we have guards but no gate. Right. I mean, it's open. Even the wall. Right. I mean, there's a wall with an arch. But I mean, come on. Right. I mean, you call that a wall? Can we walk around? Like, look, yeah, here, here, here. I just went around the wall. Yeah, it's it's definitely one of those. You can go around the side, but it's kind of stupid. Right. Exactly. (laughs) This is where the this is where the nice flat road is. Although this is a heck of an incline to take a cart full of goods down. Right. So in short. This is, uh, you're right, the dwarvish merchants will have a heck of a time coming down here. Yeah, but, um, uh, being great for tobogganing. But, yeah, yeah, it looked like a bobsled. <laughs> just just got to watch out for that uh, stop here at the end, though. Yeah. So Yeah, the, oh um, man, I could just, it'd go sailing. <laughs> it'd go sailing over the end of that cliff, man. Yes. It'd be like a ski jump. Clearly, this is not a defense, certainly not in the physical sense, right? Is there, if there is, as Mudmore was suggesting, a magic barrier, right? Um, and that's why they're on the inside, because there's no need for them to, you know, watch mm-hmm. it from the outside. Um, yes. Well, but again, I the don't other think... The other is, is quote-unquote hidden. Right. No. Is, um, is this one said to be the same? Uh No. It's not even called anything. We don't even get a like a map flag here, right? Um, I think the official one is further up, but I'm not sure because there's, a, if I'm not mistaken, there's another guard tower up the hill. Well, there's the gazebo where Arwen is standing. Yeah, there's one above I think there's, there are guards standing up there, I believe, and right. doing patrols. 
So this might be not the last stop, just sort of like the first official stop, maybe. But clearly the boundary. I mean, even to you know yeah. to make a to make a sort of a trivial point, but which seems important, the cobblestones end, right? I mean, this is the end of like Rivendell yeah. itself, right? Like you yeah, are now yeah. exiting. You're still in the area that the elves are concerned about, right? And yeah, they're still uh-huh. patrolling to make sure nobody comes down this path. But the path itself, this isn't Rivendell. Right. So this wall, this arch, it's not a wall. It's not a bastion. You know, it's not a gate. It's an it's a it's a it's a it's a boundary. Right. Mm -hmm. It's what you pass through this arch and now you're in Rivendell. Um, It's not trying to keep you out, but it is. But it is a boundary. And Um, it's keeping its own secrets. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, Maybe these are Arwen's guards. Or basically keeping an eye on people who'd go up to see her. Maybe. I could believe that if this was... Uh, but this... The, you you carry on up that path, right? To go to the Misty Mountains? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. There's so, more guards up there, too. There, there's a right. fork in the road. One end goes to Arwen, the other goes up to the Misty Mountains. But it's definitely right. one of those, you know, no one's been... You can tell by the way they're standing, no one has been fully hardy enough to try to get to Rivendell from that side or else they would be turned around the other way. Right. Right. Um, I'm interested in the fact that this uh, townsperson is asking me if I traveled far to be here. Rest here and leave your sorrows at the threshold of Imladris. I uh, see the threshold. That's what it is. It's a threshold. Oh, so she says okay. She's telling else. me this the leaves is, of Imladris never fade, so I don't know. <laughs> the, the place is a refuge from the troubles of the outside world. Mm-hmm. Leave your oh, sorrows. Now she's facing me. But she was facing the door before, like she was waiting someone to answer. Yeah, and then I interrupted her. I'm not getting the leaves comment. Yeah, the leaves of Imladris never fade, ever dancing in the winds that blow down the valley. Huh. Well, they're turning orange, so they kind of are... <laughs> anyway, um, uh, so unless this? you mean these pine trees over here, what's this building? Uh, where the guards sleep when they're not on duty, or possibly another house of uh, Nolderin. It's obviously smaller. Maybe one particular Nolderin family is. The, where the guards come from. Like one house has taken it upon themselves to be part of the guards. Yeah, like that's what they do is they are the, yes. you know, the, the wardens of the northern threshold of mm-hmm. Imladris here. Um, An interesting fact is a long time ago in the game, Boromir used to be hanging out up here. Uh, whereas the hobbits, like the members of the company, were scattered throughout Rivendell before they got put in those instance rooms that they're in now. Hmm. hmm. Before my time, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, I, ju- I, I was realizing. I was. I was. I was I th- I, for a second, I thought, I'm like, do I remember that? No. What I'm remembering is when you go searching for Boromir in Lothlorien, and he's off on the distance and up on a cliffside. That's oh, what I yeah, was thinking yeah, yeah. Of when I when I was thinking that. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so it could well be, I could be convinced that this, as you say, Valor is like a guardhouse. This is like the Rivendell idea of a, you know, a little shanty to throw up to, to, you know, shelter the guards when they're not on duty. Um, an elegant, uh, barracks. <laughs> exactly. Very elegant barracks indeed. That that's possible. I, I I like the other theory better. That it, it's not just like, you know, you rotate through here and for you know, your tour of duty, you know, which is probably only a couple hundred years long. You you know you slum it here in the in the barracks. Um, you know, I don't I don't I don't I don't think that that's I, I like better the idea that it's like as you say a particular family of Noldor, some you know strain among the Noldor who have. Take, taken this position upon themselves in a way again like it makes me think of like a mini version of the uh, um, of Balerion and its realms right in the Silmarillion mm-hmm. um, not that there is exactly a, you know a, an Angband to lay siege to here um, but 
Notice the towers on either side of the gate, too. These very full of windows. Definitely watchtowers. Well, I, I, yes, I think so. I mean, you goodness knows you'd have a lovely view from up there. <laughs> um, I mean, goodness, we're on the ground level and the view from here is a little, a little mm -hmm. obscured by trees. Can we get onto that rock? We can't, can we? It's too bad. No, and really probably nice the reason the guards are facing inward is because the people on the tower would have a better view of the out world and would be able to signal to them. Right, right. Yeah, perhaps. Well, but primary concern is keeping the inside, uh, watching over everyone on the inside, maybe. Which is Seems like, uh, well, that, like I said, there's a lot of strangers coming into Rivendell these days. Maybe it's all about policing That's them true. right now. That's true. Yes, yeah. you can get on that rock with a war steed. You can with a war steed? Yep. Okay. So you have to stop really quick or you'll ride off the other side. That's okay. <laughs> I think I am not going to try that. Um, it would probably take me several attempts to get onto that rock. Uh, and I am bad at jumping onto things. That was my down. That was why I always sucked at Super Mario Brothers. Um yeah, well, no, there's a reason this is the first video game I played, and even that's got some stuff that's got me stumped. Yes. Like, I will never successfully finish this stupid uh, hit bold daily challenges. Uh, Your th the tightrope. Oh, the stupid tightrope. Tightrope. I never. hate the tightrope. I can't even get to the top of that stupid tower with the jumping <laughs> from one thing to another. <laughs> I tried that four or five times and I'm just like, you know, no way. Like, again, like I play Ro Lotro so as not to do stuff like this. Um, anyway. Yeah. So I like this idea of these other things. Now, uh, it's getting late and I don't want to keep people up all night. Um, uh, let's, um, let's leave it here and then next time we will go down to the more, like to the like, town portion the, the mercantile sector of rivendell and see how that <laughs> seems to be fitting together um and then i want to after that we can loop back around to we can go up by arwen we can visit arwen too next time um but um yeah we'll, we'll have lots of time <laughs> yeah we will have lots of time so okay yeah we will be in rivendell in the text for uh uh for some time uh our residency here will be of some duration, as Mr. Bennett might say, in very different circumstances. Um, <laughs> but anyway, thanks very much, everybody, uh, for joining me here tonight uh, for our continued exploration of Rivendell uh, and discussions. Uh, fun class, fun field trip here tonight. And I will see you guys next week. Bye now. Goodbye. Good night. And thanks. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of The Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.